Okay. All right. Now we're, this is being recorded and um, we're just um, very fortunate today to have Morgan Ely with us. And she, she was um, recommended by uh, Shelly Waymeyer, who serves on as the chair elect for the National Consortium for Health Science Education. And um, I am Nancy Allen. I serve as executive director for NCHSE. And we do these Wednesday webinars two to four times a month. And it's really our goal to provide professional development for uh, educators, um, even those down to, and especially those down to the classroom level, because we know um, the work that you do is so important in preparing the future of um, healthcare. So thank you for being with us today. This will be recorded. It will be um, archived on our website. And uh, I think uh, Linda, I'm sorry, Morgan said she would also provide a PowerPoint. Um, and we'll put that there. And if um, and she may have some other supporting documents that she's willing to share with you as, as she'll talk about throughout her presentation. I um, have uh, awarded her honorary health science teacher membership and um, I found out that she really is not a health science teacher, but she certainly has had uh, lots of interaction and exchanges with health science teachers. Her background is um, middle school and um, also in English language arts. And she has a real passion for uh, current technical education and has done a lot of work in that area in the state of Missouri. So just remember that if you are interested in a certificate of participation that documents one hour of professional development that you may can use um, uh, through for your teacher certification, all you need to do is email me and I'll put my email here in the chat and we get those certificates out in about a week. So with that, we'll um, turn it over to Morgan, but also tell you that if you have questions, you can put those in the chat. I'm gonna be helpful to her in monitoring the, the chat space. And um, also um, we'll have a little bit of time at the end, I think for questions. So Morgan, feel free to share all you want to share about yourself and um, I'm passing the microphone to you. Well, thank you so much, Nancy. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay, thumbs up. Okay, um, thank you for that introduction and thanks for having me today. Um, like Nancy said, my name is Morgan Ely and I am an instructor at the University of Central Missouri in Warrensburg. I work in the literacy department, um, but I wanted to give you a little background about myself. Um, let's see if I can get this to, oh. Why is this not? Okay, here we go. So uh, who I am and why I know what I'm telling you. Um, I know that sometimes you go to presentations or webinars or conferences and people tell you things and then you leave and think, why do they know what they're talking about? So I wanted to give you a little bit of background about me and why I do what I do. So in 2002, I graduated from the University of Missouri in Columbia. Um, I was certified uh, 712 Language Arts Middle School. Um, I took a job at a local middle school here in Lee Summit, Missouri, which is in the exact middle of your map if you need to look at the United States. Um, I live right outside of Kansas City. And um, I took a job in the seventh and eighth grade language arts classroom and I taught there for 10 years. Um, the first year of teaching, I went ahead and got my master's in curriculum and instruction. And then after teaching for a while, I started to figure out that my true passion were with the kiddos, well, all of the kiddos um, who struggled in reading and really connecting with the curriculum um, and trying to figure out how to reach um, kiddos no matter if they were struggling or if they were gifted because I taught the whole spectrum. Um, and whenever um, you're handed curriculum and you have to figure out how to teach to every single student using the same content, it's difficult to get everyone engaged at the same time. So I taught there for 10 years. While I was there, I decided to get my ed specialist degree. Um, but before I completed my degree, I um, was certified as the reading specialist for two years. Um, and then I decided to stay home with my kiddos. Uh, that lasted just a hot minute because after three months, I knew I missed the classroom something fierce. So I reached out to some of my professors at UCM and asked them if there was a place for me. And thankfully there was. 
Um, I was an adjunct for a year and then full-time instructor since then. Um, I teach all of the content area literacy courses. So all of my students have to go through me if they want their teaching certification. Um, my job is to teach them how to implement literacy strategies no matter what their content area may be. So like I said before, um, I, well, I don't know if I said it or not, but I'm also a mom. Uh, um, John Ryan is eight, he's in second grade and Cooper Lane is six, he's in first grade. Um, and we have two very um, active little boys. And when we were faced with COVID, we knew that um, we had to go to virtual learning. Our district did whatever they could to keep us safe, but at the end of the day, they ended up sending us virtual. Um, during that time, it was super eye-opening to me that teachers still struggle with that same problem that I had when I taught in the middle school classroom. Differentiating instruction, using literacy strategies that help students no matter where they were on the spectrum of um, whether it be class within a class kiddos or regular students or advanced, it didn't matter where they were. Um, I had to figure out how to connect with just my own students um, that I was teaching online, but also my own kiddos in my home. So I have started to realize that it's important for us as teachers to bring it back to the basics, try and figure out why we are the teachers that are in the schools that are face to face with these kiddos every day and what we are um, trying to do for them. So in order to do that, I um, have created for you today um, a toolbox of things that you can use straight from this PowerPoint to take into your classroom, no matter what age the students are. Um, I find that when you're working with lots of different start learning styles um, and drawing literacy in as well, it's important to keep in mind that to keep students engaged, you have to hit those learning styles that they really want to or, or that they work best with. So the way that I like to talk about it is perspective. So as teachers, we're asked to not only see our own perspective of things, but also the per perspective of our students. And I know the older we get, the students still stay the same when we're teaching one grade and um, their perspectives on lives are on our lives are way different because they're living in a different time and growing up and and um, learning different things. So it's challenging when our students learn in different ways, but we're asked to task or I'm sorry, we're tasked to meet their need, the needs of all of them. So the first thing that I want you to do is look at this picture. So I want to know it's going to be hard on a webinar, but um, I just want you to think about um, what you see in this picture um, and then try and see something different. Some people see a beautiful woman with um, she's kind of looking over her shoulder. Um, she has kind of a feather over the front of her face. Um, she has long hair, um, very elegant. And then some people look at it and see an older woman uh, with her chin kind of pointed down. Um, she is um, very drawn looking. She uh, is, has kind of a, a collar. Um, and when we see something different than others, sometimes we forget to ask ourselves why. Why do we see something different? So as teachers, it's important for us to go into our classrooms and know that every kiddo or student, sorry, I call my students kiddos no matter how old they are. Um, all of our students may see things differently than how we see them. So for my goals that I set for our time together today, I want to demonstrate some different strategies for assisting students in understanding a variety of concepts, um, no matter how that is given to them, whether it be through text or um, listening or speaking, images, that's all literacy. Literacy is anything that you take in um, to help you understand a concept. I also want to introduce you to some um, different effective note taking strategies, which I know sounds kind of boring, but I promise it's not. Um, I grew up in a really small town and I didn't ever really have to study in high school. And then I got to college and was very shocked at what I needed to do. Um, and I would have liked to have been more prepared um, on creating study materials. 
Uh, and then I want to take you through some hands-on activities to take back to your classroom and implement right away. And then hopefully have, we have some time for questions at the end. So the first part um, is going to be talking about active reading with text. Um, there are different um, topics that I'm going to take you through. The first one is preparing for new vocabulary. Um, when I was in school, I remember my teacher handing out a list of vocabulary words and we had to look up the definition and then use the, the word in a sentence. Well, most of the time that sentence didn't make any sense because I didn't know what the definition was of the word. So this is called a vocabulary word leveler. Um, this is an activity where I have three sections divided in my classroom, a level one, words that are easy, a level two, words that make you go, hmm, and then level three, when you say, is that even a word? Is that in the dictionary at all? So I hand out little um, sticky notes to students. They read a piece of text. When they come across a vocabulary word that they don't know, um, then they can put it in a level three, level two, level one. Um, and then I have them go place them on the walls around the room. Um, from there, we go through each section and talk about the words. And that is kind of an introductory activity to vocabulary. From there, I like to take our vocabulary words and put them on a word wall. I did um, take these pictures um, from images on Google because there are tons of ways to do word walls. I'm definitely a left side of the screen kind of person. Um, I like to think very linear in very linear terms. Um, they have to make sense. And then there are people that have word walls like on the right where they just stick a word up on the wall. Uh, visibility is huge when it comes to literacy because the more times a person sees the word, um, they become more familiar with it and they're, they um, more easily use it in their everyday language. So I like to leave a word wall up in my classroom. Even in my college classes, I have my students um, create word walls and we leave them up. And so we can refer back to those vocabulary words as we go through the semester. I don't know if anybody remembers the game Minute to Win It, but I like to create games for my classroom because my students, I don't like when students just sit for very long. So these are pictures of some of my college students that I did get permission to use. Um, on the Minute to Win It games, it was a show uh, a while ago, They people had one minute to complete a task that was kind of silly. So what I do is I wrote vocabulary words on the bottom of red solo cups, and then I stacked them up all, all mismatched. <laughs> Excuse me. So then I put one minute on the clock. They have one minute to unstack them, alphabetize them, and then stack them back up. The team that gets it the quickest gets some kind of treat like a Jolly Rancher or a Laffy Taffy or something like that. Um, it's amazing what people will do for just a small piece of candy. So that's just a way to get them to visualize where a, word, a vocabulary word is in the dictionary. And also it gives them a chance to um, put that word in their brain using schema. I like to talk about how schema is kind of like a coat rack in your brain. And the more information you get about a certain topic, you hang it on the same coat rack. And that's where you retrieve that information from when you need it. The next activity um, is called Word Doctors. This is really fun and maybe super easy because we're all in masks right now, but um, I like to break bones of words. So I use a printout and you can just use um, simple strips of paper too, but I'll use suffixes and prefixes or and root words, or I'll do vocabulary and definitions and I'll break them apart. And the students have to use tweezers, surgical gloves and wear a face mask while they build these bones back together. And then they make a list of the vocab and definitions that they have created. Um, and again, I make it a competition. How many can you get before the end of the three minutes is up? The next one you may have seen before, but I put a little bit of an extra twist on it. It's called an alpha box. An alpha box is basically just a grid of um, 
alphabet uh, of the alphabet. Uh, I like to hand out a piece of text to my students that they've never seen before and have them do a cold read, um, just a, reading through it without looking at anything else. And while they're reading it, I want them to find words that are new to them. Um, when they are using the alpha box, I have the students write down any vocabulary words um, that start with each of the letters. I challenge them to find as many different words that start with different letters throughout. Um, and at the end, we go through these words and we, I took it a step further and we do an evidence trash compactor. So um, students can either throw the word away or they can keep it. And if they throw the word away, it just means that they understand it, but they didn't really understand it in that context, but now it's okay. Um, and if it stays on the alpha box, then we transfer it to our word wall. Um, this is a simple T-chart that I've changed to just call be called known to me as. So instead of handing out a graphic organizer that looks like this, that's blank and students roll their eyes and say, oh, I don't want to do this. I make it kind of fun. So on the left side, they're going to put any vocabulary or phrases that are new to them. And then on the right, they're going to explain in their own words uh, what that word means. And they can't use any help for it. They have to kind of come up with their own idea of what it is. Um, this is a super quick just chart of how they can, um, that they can refer back to. And then again, we take those words and put them up on our word wall. So if you uh, can tell from any vocabulary that I use, I just continue to keep them and put them up on the word wall throughout. So it stays with that visibility. Um, I saw, uh, I went to a conference um, not just a few years ago and a teacher was talking about KWL charts and how you can change them to fit your classroom needs. Um, and so I started thinking about what you really need to have in a KWL chart for students to be engaged. Um, so now I use KRUQ charts, which would be, what do you know? What have you read or heard? What do you understand? And then any questions that you still have. Um, so moving on to um, the next part of thought provoking questions. Um, I don't know if I need to look back at the chat to see if anybody had any questions. Um, uh, I haven't, they have, the only question was about, uh, did they need to be taking notes, um, like no tomorrow, and I was telling, we told them the session is recorded, and are you going to um, provide this PowerPoint, or maybe yes. some kind of outline, okay, so that'll be posted on our website, everyone, yes. so you can. You, can, you don't have to take every every note, okay? No, and I apologize that I go quickly, but I do um, have a lot of tools that I wanna talk about and I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. So I'm really sorry if I'm going too quick and I can always answer questions um, in the end too. Um, so the next section that I wanna talk about is thought provoking questions. And these are all fun activities that I use <laughs> with my students. Um, when we need to talk about different opinions. Um, and this has been pretty fun, especially in the uh, climate that our world is in right now. There are a lot of opposing viewpoints to things. So um, this is a twist on a Socratic seminar. When I was in middle school, when I taught in the middle school classroom, I um, would set up Socratic seminars. So I'm not sure if you're familiar, but uh, there would be a circle in the middle and then a circle on the outside. And they had to discuss something and then someone could go and tap them out and trade places with them. And then the conversation would continue. So I took that a little bit further. Um, and what I like to do is have a class council meeting. So the first thing I do is propose a question that creates different opinions from the students. Um, have them take a side or something that just provokes thought. Um, then I place the desks in a big circle and I just let a class council meeting start. I give the students the floor and allow time for them to ask questions. I usually ask a student to be my moderator um, and give them a couple of starter questions to get the conversation going. Um, and then once all of the opinions are heard and different options, then I have the students write a quick summary about what they experienced. 
and if their views changed or anything. It's, a, it's an interesting introduction to a topic because students, before they actually dive into the content, have an opportunity to show us what they already know or what they have misinformation about. The next one is called Sculpting Thoughts. This is really fun because it does not matter how old you are. If you get a tub of Play-Doh, it's kind of therapeutic. So I, again, pose a thought-provoking question to my students. Um, I give them a little bit of time to chat with each other about the answer that they may have, the opinion that they feel. And then I pair them up with someone who feels very similar to them um, and give them a tub of Play-Doh. So then I ask the students to sculpt their answer out of Play-Doh, which may seem difficult, but it's very interesting what students can do um, with Play-Doh and how they can represent their thoughts. Um, it's really good for kinesthetic learners and kids who really like hands-on things. Um, and then afterwards, once they have their sculptures done, um, I have one of the students be a docent and share what they um, have sculpted. And then that again brings up another opportunity for us to have a conversation. Barometer of opinions is a great way to get students out of their seats and walking around and chatting. And I know that's difficult during COVID. I know the um, staying three feet apart and all of the recommendations, but this can still be done as long as you have students um, give each other space. I like to set my tables up if I have tables in a U shape. Um, and then I make a statement that causes students to develop a strong opinion. It doesn't matter if you tell students that peanut butter M&Ms are the best candy in the world, or if you have an opinion about a medical procedure, they, they want to tell you their opinion on it. So barometer of opinions is really fun because um, as the teacher, you stand in front, you read a statement, and then you have students stand on one side of the table if they agree, on the other side if they disagree, and then the neutral students at the back. And then you give them time to talk with each other to, to figure out who feels the most strongly that way, and they have to line themselves up on the spectrum of where their beliefs really lie. Um, students have to defend themselves with I statements, and this gives me an opportunity as a teacher to talk about how to write opinion pieces and also to defend myself. So I would make them say things like, I believe peanut M&Ms are better because, or um, just a way for them to connect with the statement using that I statement. From there, I can move us back to our seats and we can start um, either reading a piece of text over the topic or doing whatever project is next. Um, so that moves us into our main ideas and summary section. So I teach um, eight different courses at the university and I try really hard to make sure that the textbooks that I've chosen um, fit with all of my student learning objectives. I'm sure you do the same. Um, but there are times when the textbooks are really thick and the print is really small and it's pretty overwhelming. So what I like to do is get copies of the text before class starts. I tell them not to buy their books yet. They come into class and I put these questions up on the board. And they take the textbook and they answer them. So it's just kind of a scavenger hunt for them to familiarize themselves with the actual text. Um, instead of saying, read chapters one through five and take this quiz. I have the students go through and figure out um, what the title of the textbook is. What edition is it? Describe the, co the cover. Um, who's the book dedicated to? Why is it important? Um, and then I, at the bottom, I have them say, what are your thoughts about this? And what are your concerns? From that information, then I can figure out how to talk to my students about the text. If they're very apprehensive, then I can show them why I've chosen the book that I have and also give them an idea of where we're going with the text. This can work with just a single chapter. It can work with a whole textbook. It doesn't matter. It just gives the students an opportunity to own what they're about to read. Um, the main idea high five seems like a very elementary um, 
strategy, but it's unbelievable how many of my students can create a main idea sentence or find the main idea based on just this strategy. So I have students stick out their hand and then once they read a piece of text, they have to tell me the where, the when, the why, the what, the who, and the how. And then we talk about how that can be um, condensed into a main idea. Um, how we can throw out the rest of the information to just focus on that one concept. Another um, summaries or main idea is the two word wrap up. My students get so angry when, it, not really, but so angry when I ask them to do this because um, it's hard. I have them get in groups and create a list a list of any word that they find important or that describes the information that we've read together. Once they do that, we go through as a class and cross out any word that's not the most important. Um, and once we get down to like 10 or so, then I have them condense it even farther into two words. So two words wrapping up the main idea of a, of a piece of text and a way for them to then um, kind of connect back to what we've done. I use this a lot as an exit strategy, just on an exit ticket, because I can really quickly go through and figure out who's got it and who doesn't um, without a ton of grading. Um, it also allows the students to vocalize their opinions um, of a piece and also talk through what they think is important and why it is. This next activity is called Keyhole Perspective. <laughs> Excuse me. So um, what I have students do is a lot like the wrap up. I have students brain brainstorm a list of uh, things that really um, impacted them in a piece of text. I'll have them read something and then write down all of the key terms that they thought were important. Um, and then I have some cardstock cut out um, with a keyhole and then I have them get a blank sheet of paper put the keyhole over it, and then they have to write the words that they find important um, inside that smaller keyhole. Um, then we talk about perspective and how that's different for some people than it is to others, and how you can um, have very narrow focus on a topic, but in fact, there are things outside of the keyhole that matter as well. So we talk about perspective, um, and who people are and why they come to topics like they do. Social media runs our world right now. Um, as much as we hate it, technology is something that has been the only thing to keep us connected through this crazy year, almost a year, it's nuts. Um, so I like to talk in terms of social media when it comes to summarizing. Um, after a class, at the end of class, I have students write a summary of what we've talked about that day. And I use these words um, to decide the length and how many characters they have to have. Because the first question every student asks is, how long does it have to be? How much do I have to have? Um, so I talk about a Facebook summary. People on Facebook can write a novel. They can write paragraph after paragraph. Um, and then an Instagram post is uh, shorter and may have an image with it. And then a Twitter is less than 200 characters. So if I want something longer, I tell them that they need to have a Facebook post. If I want something shorter and maybe with an image, then I have them do an Instagram post. And with Twitter, they can only give me 200 characters. Most of the time I go to Twitter so I can do a quick exit ticket and figure out who's got it and who needs help the next day. Um, so six word memoirs have been around for quite a while. Um, Ernest Hemingway was actually um, tasked with writing an entire story with just six words. Um, his words were baby shoes for sale, never worn. It's very sad, but that's what he came up with. So what I like it to do is have my students come up with their own six word memoir. Um, it's a way for them to summarize the important ideas and also be very conscious of their um, word choice and their purpose behind their summaries. So I actually have 
And Nancy, I hope this works. Um, I actually have an example of this. So hopefully it'll work. So basically, I'm sorry, I gotta pull this back up. So basically, um, I have my students go through and, um, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I have my students go through after they've written or um, gone through a piece of text and create their own six word memoir. Sometimes I put it into a slideshow like that. Sometimes I just have them create an image of some kind to support it. Sometimes we just share out, but students love trying to figure out how to get their summaries down to six words. Um, and it's really fun to help them pick their text and word choices um, to show that they actually understand what we've talked about. Um, so the next part, and um, this is the um, second to last section, but uh, collaborative group ideas can be really difficult with students. It doesn't matter how um, old they are or what grade they're in. They can be middle schoolers or they can be post-secondary. There's always going to be students who struggle to be in groups. So um, I always try and focus on these five topics whenever we're forming groups. The positive interdependence, like basically how are you contributing? Um, how are you interacting face-to-face? How are you being accountable? How are you establishing norms? And then how are you processing criticism? So those are the five things that um, drive this. And I'm gonna give you some examples. So earlier we talked a little bit about um, the building with Play-Doh. Um, I really like bringing in manipulatives, manipulatives for students to build things. These were actually built by my college students. Um, when we talked about what literacy is and how it interacts with us in everyday life. Uh, I gave them a bin of Legos and had them just represent what they thought. It was really fun to see because literacy could be a very difficult thing to represent, but these students really hit it out of the park. So dropping a bin of Legos in front of students and saying, I want you to build something that represents X, Y, Z. Um, it's fun to see what they create. Conversation roundtable is really fun. Um, well, I don't know if it's fun, but it's it's easy for teachers to um, really keep track of what your students and groups are doing. So I like to fold, I usually use a bigger piece of paper and fold it into four quadrants. Um, and I give each person in the group a job um, and they are to record all of the things that they research or find in their own box. So they're not writing in anyone else's information. Um, and once they have all of their boxes complete, then they take all of that information and create some end project. Maybe that's a presentation, maybe it's um, something visual, um, but I can see from those quadrants who has contributed what and who may need a little extra boost. This is something that I wish I would have known when I was in seventh and eighth grade in the seventh and eighth grade classroom. Um, it's called a jigsaw. And I know that lots of people use this. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So when literature is super overwhelming to students, um, instead of forcing them to read the entire text, I like to break it up. So what I do is I go through and I section things out. Maybe it's a chapter, maybe it's 
two subheadings, maybe it's a page. Um, and each person is assigned just that one section. And then at the end, they present to the class or to their group the, what they've learned and how they become an expert just on that information. And it gives the other students an opportunity to take notes, to figure out what they missed because they didn't read that part, but also lets them in on what information may be uh, useful to them later. Um, this works so well when students really struggle with the amount of text that you're giving them because then they know that they are only responsible for the two pages that you're giving them or whatever the section may be. Um, and then it is their responsibility to teach the rest of the students. So everybody's relying on them, but not relying on them to read an entire chapter of 50 plus pages. Uh, group me messaging is a great tool if you're not familiar it's a free app I have students um, when we went um, virtual I needed to know that their collaboration was still on track. So I had them um, create groups on group me messaging um, and they would uh, have collaborative conversations and they also just added me in, which was really nice because then you can see um, I would just like a comment. Um, and that showed them that not only was I reading it, but it also kept track of who was posting, who needed to, um, who needed help, um, anything in their project, any questions. And so it was just a smaller group that was collaborating instead of like a whole group or a whole class at the same time. This is how I grouped my students for virtual collaboration and it worked very well. Like I said, it's a free app. Um, and then the gallery walk is something that I started doing. Um, when I got to the college classroom, and I wish I would have started it earlier in my teaching career, but it's a culmination of a large project. So we all have those semester projects that take a long time for the students to um, complete. And then it's very daunting for the for the teacher to have to grade them all. So instead of just sitting um, at home <laughs> at night and grading till wee hours of the morning, I had students present a gallery. So in this picture, you can see the students had to create a presentation. I believe this was on a nonfiction piece and they um, created some kind of display. Both of these groups decided on the trifold, but they could also use technology. I'm, I'm sure you can see that iPad sitting there in front. Um, so what I did was I set it up in the in the room like kind of like an art gallery and I gave them um, a link to a Google Doc that they could then um, give responses for each project. So they had to give a critique and then also a positive and then a question that they might have still. Um, this was a huge part of us talking about processing criticism and understanding that when people say things, it's um, how to pose questions without being hurtful um, and discrediting the work that the team has done. I usually also serve food because who doesn't love a gallery walk with a nice cookie or something. On that same line, I use the genre cafe. Um, when <clears throat> students have to read a new type of book that they're not familiar with, it becomes kind of scary almost. Um, a lot of students shy away from the more technical reading because they think that it might be boring or they just aren't um, aware of how to read it. So what I do is I set up, <coughs> excuse me, I set up, um, red and white check tablecloths in my classroom and on the table are books. And so for each genre, they have their own table. I'm sorry. So students go around and taste different books. They go and find um, a book that they may not pick up any other way. And they'll look at some descriptions, the genre. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Um, the genre, the setting, synopsis, take some notes, and then they'll also rate it on a scale of one to five at, at how likely they would be to want to read it. And that helps me place them in reading groups because I want to give them the opportunity to choose what they're reading because they're way more likely to actually read something if they have the opportunity to have some sense of uh, why they're reading what they are. Um, the 
other one that I wanted to talk about was a boggle of ideas. I don't know if you ever played boggle when you were a kid, but we still play with our sons and love it. So um, at the end of a text, I will have students create, brainstorm a list of characteristics or facts um, and then have them share out. And if something's repeated, you have to cross it off your list. Um, and then the one who has the most at the end wins the competition. This gives us an opportunity to just kind of wrap up a topic through text um, and giving them an opportunity to show off what they've retained throughout a unit. Team research and debate is one of my favorite things to make my students do, and they really do enjoy it. This is another opportunity for you to create opposing views in your classroom. So you pose a question and have the students decide if they're pro or against, and then they spend however much time you want to give them researching their side. So they're basically going to debate against the other side to decide what they, you know, stand for. Um, and then on the day of presentations, I flip the script and I make them defend the opposing side of the argument. Most of them come in and say, oh no, but what I teach them in the beginning is when they're doing research, if they look at both sides of a topic, then they um, should be very well versed in both opinions and they can defend either side. And it's interesting to see how many people have different viewpoints at the end of the day because they've also reached researched both sides of something. So here are some tech tools that I will just show you real quickly. I'm not going to click on all the links, but um, Buncee is a way for collaboration because they can create um, a communication tool. They can do interactive things. It's a way to do presentations. Um, PictoCharts does a lot of infographics, so they can take any text or data and then turn it into an infographic for you, which is super cool. Um, Visme does both infographics and presentations. Padlet is an amazing way to have a discussion on a board, uh, a digital wall. So it's basically digital sticky notes that students can then apply um, to the digital wall and have conversations. All of these are free. Um, you can upgrade, of course, with some payment, but if you want new apps for your students to use, these are a, good, a great place to start. And I'm gonna go on to some more too. So um, I have my students do a lot of presentations. Uh, the first one is to have a is to have a press conference. So I don't, I have my students watch a little clip of a C-SPAN press conference. And I don't know, um, I want you to make sure that you're actually looking at the clip before you show it because uh, there are some press conferences that are not appropriate for all students. Um, I give students a topic to research and then I have them present kind of vaguely on the topic, just kind of an overview. And then I just let the questions fly. I have all of the students um, in front of their device so they can find answers. I use the presenter as a moderator. I actually plant questions throughout my students that they're going to be asked. That way, if a student is able to answer all of the questions given to them, I know that they've done their research and have their background. So I kind of run the questions um, without them knowing that I'm running it. So they know that, um, the, so they're having students ask them questions, but I'm the one who created the questions to be asked. This is really fun. It's called a cereal presentation. Um, I save my cereal boxes throughout the year and I give each student um, or group of students a cereal box. They have certain things that they have to put on each side of the box. This is an example. Um, it's called Wright Krispies and it was a story over um, the Wright brothers that the the student read and they have to create a cereal, design the box and on each side um, of the information panels are different things. Maybe it's character setting, plot, um, the back I've had them create games that someone could play if they bought the cereal. Um, the top is usually a citation. So it's just a fun way for them to present what they've read. Um, this is a super independent activity. It's called Genius Hour. Actually, one of my colleagues used this, um, my colleague from my seventh and eighth grade teaching years, um, and she still uses it and loves it, and I think it's a brilliant idea. 
So she has students pick a topic, any topic they want. She's had students learn how to play the guitar. She's had learn, students learn how to knit. She's had students learn how, about blood transfusions. She's just tons of different things. Um, then they have to decide how they're going to showcase the knowledge that they under that they um, research. Um, they do their own research and they design their own rubrics and their plans and come up with the needed resources. And then for X amount of time every week, usually an hour, they have time to work on it. So this is a great way for students to start in the beginning of the year or beginning of the semester to work on a project long term. Um, this is a way that they can stick with something the entire time and really build upon what they're learning. So here are some tech tools for visual content. If you are looking for some visuals, um, Clips is a free app for making videos. Um, Time Toast Timeline is a timeline creator. And this is actually really cool. You just enter the dates and then a timeline can be created for you or you can do your own. Um, I have my students in my um, introduction to children's lit course do um, a timeline and a lot of them use time toast timeline and they really like it. It's, it's very user friendly. iMovie is very popular. Um, they can create movie trailers or full length movies. They really like things like that. We video is for Chromebook users. It's a lot like iMovie. I know the school district where I live uses Chromebooks so, and not every app is, um, is compatible with a Chromebook, but we video is. So if you're looking for something for them to use, it's cloud-based so they don't have to download anything. Um, and then TouchCast Studio is also interactive videos and it's free for iPads. So kind of the same thing. You can embed web pages or Twitter feeds, images, any of that stuff. So really quickly, I'm trying to be um, aware of the time, but so I talked a little bit briefly about note taking and how important it is. And there are definitely times when students need to take notes, but have no idea how. The first way that I tell my students is the good old fashioned outline way. The topic, main sub, or I'm sorry, the subtopic, and then any thoughts that follow. And then I have students who also like the Cornell notes where they write a key term or a question on the left and then notes on the right. Um, and these are very, um, good for linear thinkers, but then you have the kiddos where this might work better, um, a mind map or sketch notes. Mind map is a graphic organizer and it can be so easy to just print off a blank one um, off of a, a template site and they put the main idea in the middle and then in the boxes around it, they put their ideas or things that they've learned from lecture and then they're all just in one nice little um, graphic organizer. However, it may be a little messy to them, but that's how they see things. Um, and then the new, then I would say the newest way that people are taking notes is called sketch noting. And if you are not um, aware of how to sketch note, you, you should look it up because it's really, really cool. Um, there are lots of YouTube videos on how to, but basically it's a bunch of doodles and different fonts and different colors. I don't know how many times I wasted my breath telling students, hey, stop doodling on that, pay attention. But at the end of the day, some of them are just auditory learners and sketch noting is a way for them to draw and also be listening at the same time. So those are the four ways that um, you can talk about taking notes to your students. Um, they need to know that writing things down helps you remember something 70% better than if you didn't. And it is important for them to get their ideas down on a page, no matter how that looks. From those notes, then I talked to my students about how to make their own study guides. Um, we talked about color coding, whether you wanna type it or handwrite it, line paper, blank paper, horizontal, notebook, whatever um, works for them. From them making their own study guides, then I asked them to create test questions that they think I should implement on tests. Um, and then this way they already have the answers because they've created the questions themselves. Um, I do set ground rules for that and make sure they know that if they want to um, contribute a test question, then it has to be valid. Um, it's not guaranteed to show up on the test, but it also shows me what they find most important on the test because more times than not, they're a lot harder on themselves than I would be in, in, 
in it anyway. Um, here are a few things of technology that can help uh, those struggling readers. Text to speak, you type in the text and it talks back to them. Um, audiobooks is just what it says. Audiobooks are fantastic. I am an audiobook junkie. I love them. Um, but also I have my students listen to audiobooks while they're looking at the text that we're, they're reading or listening to. So they get that w, double stimulation. Um, the Scan and Read Pro is a great tool to have for struggling readers because you can highlight a piece of text and put it into the box and then it reads it back to them. Um, super simple highlighter is great. Um, and then also Quizlet.com, if you're not familiar with that, you can create stacks of flashcards and also quizzes for vocabulary or whatever the case may be. Um, those are great things that my students really use. I actually asked them to help me come up with the list of technology that can be helpful, and this is what they said they use. Um, they also told me some things if they're struggling readers. Rewordify is an excellent piece. This It's my favorite because you can put a piece of text into Rewordify and it will reword how um, something is written so someone can understand it on a different Lexile. Um, and on that same note, Newzella is a great website because you can print off the same article um, in three different Lexile ranges. So if you have students ranging from struggling reader to gifted, but you wanna get the same information across, you can go in, find an article, change the Lexile and print it, give it to them to read. Now everybody has the same information, but given them to them in a way that they better understand it. So as we wrap up, and again, I'm really sorry that that was so quick. I just have so many things to tell you. Um, I just want to bring us back to that perspective of the woman um, looking over her shoulder and then also the older woman looking down. Um, this was on the internet a couple of years ago. Um, is it blue and black or is it white and gold? And so just to leave you with some questions, how does your perspective change your thought process? And how can you change your classroom to help all of your students um, and understand what their perspectives are on the text and also any of the literacy strategies that you bring to the classroom? So for me, that's it. The only thing that I want to say before I open it to questions is that, like I said, my name's Morgan Ely. Um, I'm at the University of Central Missouri in Warrensburg. My email is on the screen. And one of my favorite things to do, and I know this is crazy to say, but if you're ever working on a lesson plan and you would really like help figuring out how to implement some different literacy strategies and activities, if you want to email, email me, um, we can set up a time to chat and I can help you implement some things things that might make things more interactive or more engaging. I'm always open to doing so. So thanks for having me. And I would love to answer any questions that anybody has. Nancy, did you want to look at the chat or do you want me to just open it up? You can just open it up. I didn't, I didn't see any questions. Um, you covered a lot of information. I mean, and, every, and everybody stayed on. So I think they were, um, you know, they were very interested in what you had to say. So we'll, I'll just be quiet for a moment and see if anyone has any questions. I know, I know they're um, off to the races to use some of these strategies for sure. Well, I know it's a lot and it's really fast. So hopefully I can. A question. Yes, I'm sorry. Who, who's talking? Uh, Catherine DeLise. I'm um, a teacher in Georgia. Um, do you have like, cause I think I sometimes struggle with like, these are really great ideas, but then like, if I went to go like, think about putting them back in my classroom, I would be like, wait, what did she say? And like, how do I do this? And I could spend a lot of time because I'm sure a lot of these ideas are probably also online. Mm -hmm. um, like I could look them up, but is there like a great like book that you would recommend that has just like these kind of strategies? Like, is there like a great resource that would you would recommend? Like if we're looking for, Cause like, I'm just coming from a, I come from an industry background. I have no education. So everything is just, right. Um, you know, what I'm kind of learning on the fly. So I love like, just, I don't know if that makes sense. It does. It does. Absolutely. So um, I'm going to kind of answer your question twofold. So the first one is that 
these strategies that I um, kind of threw at you today are ones that I have used um, and put my own spin on. So there are some online, but they're, um, I'm not exactly sure what they're called, but I have um, one book that sticks out to me. Well, I have several books that stick out, but one, um, and I cannot recall the author off the top of my head, but it's called um, Writing That Rocks. And it's all about nonfiction. No, I'm sorry. It's all about, is it about, no, it's about nonfiction texts and how to implement those in your classroom easier, um, different strategies that you can use. So um, is it nonfiction writing that rocks? I think it might be that. It's a black book and it has a guitar on the front. Um, the other book, um, one of my biggest, I mean, one of somebody that I think is an incredible um, implementer of strategies like this is uh, Marsha Tate. Um, she does um, the mm, dendrites. I can't remember the name of it right now. Worksheets don't grow dendrites and that she has it for different um, content areas. And she actually, um, goes through and lists strategies just like this. Well, not, not these exactly, but different strategies such as they, as these and, and gives more of an overview of how to implement them. Um, as far as your coming, you coming from an industry background, um, my biggest piece of advice to you is to think about, um, not stepping away from the content, but um, thinking about just having more discussions um, because that piece of literacy is often lost and making sure that conversations are occurring about what you're reading and what you're talking about um, instead of just pencil to paper. Um, that's, that's something that I have really struggled with going from um, a classroom teacher to a literacy instructor is trying to break away from just putting pencil to paper and using more of that creative piece um, and having students really reach into their where they're most uncomfortable um, and and kind of uh, going through problem solving that way. Does that help at all? Yes, thank you. Did you see there was a question about rubrics? I think you addressed that, but Lisa may have mentioned, missed that. So okay. I, actually, I actually have some um, rubrics that I will be giving to Nancy probably tomorrow for her to um, put up with this, if that's okay with you, Nancy. Yes, that's perfect. <clears throat> also, there's a um, question from Lisa, the same person who asked about the rubrics. rubrics. Um, she's, how would you recommend beginning to use some of these strategies? And what is there some that might be best for certain um, grades um, as she's in the nine through 12 setting? Okay. That's a great question. So um, for all of these strategies, I only, <laughs> I know that there were a lot, so saying only is kind of silly, but the only ones that I included are ones that I have used with all grades. Um, I think the easiest one to do from the very beginning is the barometer of opinions. I love that one because it takes absolutely zero prep work except for finding statements that you want to use. So um, you can go online and find any kind of statement. It could be something so silly um, or it could be more serious. And you ask them uh, where their stance is and they have to line up according to who agrees most to who disagrees most. And then they figure out where they are on the spectrum of agreeing or disagreeing. And then I have them write about it. I think that's one of the biggest things is that all of these strategies that I use are very quick because then I have them go back and write about their experience. So instead of writing about the text, we're writing about the conversation we had with the other people in our classroom about the content. I hope that helps. Okay, um, Morgan, Morgan, I was just saying that um, you were with us last year in St. Louis in 2019 at the National Health Science Conference. Okay. It was in your state. And I also said um, as a tagline to that, let's hope she can join us 
in October of 2021, which um, that would be if we're able to do a face-to-face -face or a hybrid conference, will be in Cincinnati, Ohio. So just um, putting a plug out for another opportunity that they might have to hear from you. Yeah. But I, in case you missed it, again, this will be, uh, the recording will be posted on our website at healthscienceconsortium.org forward slash webinars, along with the PowerPoint, along with some rubrics, I think that she's promised. And um, we just appreciate you so much, Morgan. Oh my gosh, what a wealth of information you had here. I think we could have, we may could have done this in like three webinars, but- um, I know, I'm you, sorry. <laughs> but we also know that you said to me yesterday during our practice session that you would be available to do another um, webinar for us this semester. So we just invite everybody to continue to look on our website at the events tab, and that's where we'll post upcoming um, webinars. Also give us about a week. Sometimes there's a, a lag time with our um, web team to get the information up. And also remember if you're interested in a certificate of participation, just uh, send that request to me at nancy at healthscienceconsortium.org. Again, thanks so much, Morgan. Uh, we appreciate your time and um, you do talk fast, but you have a lot to share. So um, we listen fast as well. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of your Wednesday, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having me.